Christmas, everyone. And I know it's the 27th and Christmas day is officially behind us. I gotta put my glove on cause it's cold, right? It's officially behind us, but have you ever sang a song about a partridge in a pear tree where your true love gives you a whole bunch of crap you don't need that you're gonna have to return to Meyer the next day and makes a whole lot of work for you, right? The 12 days of Christmas, Christmas ain't over yet, right? Christmas lasts until Epiphany on uh, January uh, 5th is the 12th day of Christmas. So we got Christmas for 12 days still. It's called Christmas Tide. Um, so Christmas Tide, this is kind of where the light has come. Advent was the preparation for Christmas Day. It ends on Christmas Eve night the evening christmas eve is the evening right it ends on christmas evening and that then sparks the 12 days of christmas and it's 12 days of feasts um, christmas day is obviously the christ's mass it's christ's feast and then the next day the following day the day after christmas uh, second day of christmas is the feast of saint stephen it's really interesting that the very following day of uh, following Christmas, we celebrate the church's first martyr. We recognize St. Stephen, the first martyr from uh, Acts chapter, I believe it's seven or eight, somewhere in there. Uh, we celebrate him because when the light has come into this world, uh, which we've been preparing for for Advent, when the light has come, when Christmas has come, uh, changes everything and we give our lives to it. That's why we celebrate uh, St. Stephen the following day. Uh, and then after that is the Feast of St. John because when the light has come and we see things from a different perspective, sometimes that sets us in isolation. Remember John, the Apostle John, he wrote the book of Revelation, was cast off to the island of Patmos forever, right? So that is kind of Christmas tide season. We welcome to that and uh, welcome to this service. It's a little abbreviated one. Uh, because we just had Christmas Eve and frankly, I'm cold out here. We're gonna get her done, right? Hopefully you're all bundled up in your warm cozy Sundays and I uh, got a roast in the pot in the, in the crock pot or something But we'll have a few readings and a few um, a few prayers and whatnot and I'll see you soon Christmas we light the Christ can remind us of the divine nature of Christ who lived a full human experience so that so now so that now we can embrace every facet hope overcomes evil sin and even death During the shortest days of the year, during this season of hope, be the light. Amen. Merry Christmas, Christmas and, and a Happy, Happy New, New year. year. From Pat and Eugene Hirsch.
Today's passage is from Luke 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Peniel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they turned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Part one. All right, so today's passage was out of Luke 2, right? That's uh, Jesus was just born. It's the eight days later marker. And his parents, Mary and Joseph, got to take him to the temple. That's their custom. That's what they do. Uh, and they have to do um, this thing called the offering. They got to do the what's in the Deuteronomic law to make sure that they do all, of, check all the religious boxes that they got to do, right? So out of Leviticus 5 comes this passage that says, after a child has been born, you have to go present an offering at the temple. Um, if you got enough cash, which cash in this day is livestock, they don't use like cash cash. If you got enough cash, um, offer up a sheep. Uh, if you don't have enough uh, financial uh, repertoire to do that, then offer up two turtle doves. Uh, hence 12 days of Christmas, two turtle doves, right? And if you don't have that, then you get two quarts of flour. So here, what we find out about Jesus in the very first section of this um, story is Jesus is not born into wealth or power or influence. Jesus is born into, um, yes, the, the royal family line of the King David from like First Kings and Samuel and all that. Like that's who Jesus' ancestors are. That's who Joseph's ancestors are. But it's more like this failed family line of former royalty that's now in this lower middle class status of just paycheck to paycheck trying to get by. They're not on the bottom rung of offering up two quarts of flour, but they're not offering a sheep either because they don't have the, the well-to-do-ness to do that. They offer the two turtle doves, which means that they're born, Jesus is born into 
like this lower middle class uh, status of a family. That's this former royalty. Used to be the line, of, well still is the line of David, but used to be this kingly line and now, uh, now they're just kind of nobodies, right? Now we're celebrating the birth of this, like of this one baby boy born in a barn uh, like 2,000 years ago to a middle class family he didn't, he didn't ever write a book. His followers, he had like, you know, 12, but then one denied him. Uh, he had a little bit of interested followers. Maybe a hundred people were actually his disciples, but he never wrote anything down. He never, uh, he never had more than 11 close friends. So why are we still talking about this guy? Why are we still um, rotating our whole culture, world, around this Christmas season, the birth, celebrating the birth of this, uh, this one baby boy born into this middle of nowhere to a bunch of nobodies. Simeon here, uh, he gets some corrective lenses put on because he had some expectations. He knew um, that because he was devout, that he was religious, that he heard directly from God, you're not gonna die until you see the Messiah, right? He was led by the Spirit that day to the temple. So this is a very religious, devout, um, walking closely with God individual. And yet what we see here with Simeon uh, is that Simeon has corrective lenses that need to be put on because before he sees Jesus, before he meets the, the little uh, baby Jesus. He thinks that the Messiah is for Israel, for the redemption or rescue of Israel. What does that mean? That phrase, the redemption and rescue of Israel, is a common phrase at the time that says the Messiah will be a military leader that frees them from being under the servitude of their occupying super worldly power, Rome. They're going to raise them up and get them into a status of you're now in charge of your land again. Give them back their land, give them back their monarchy, give them back everything, right? So his first expectation, as you read in verse 25, is that he's going to rescue the people of Israel. Uh, and that, that redemption of Israel is specifically tied to giving them back their land and their sovereignty. But after he sees Jesus, after he sees Jesus, he realizes he's the savior to all people and he's the light to the nations. There's like this shift happening. He's the savior of Israel that's going to save us from Rome. And then he sees Jesus and everything changes. Everything shifts in the light of the birth of this uh, baby uh, boy, Jesus. All, he's a light. He's a savior for all people and a light to all the nations. No longer just co-opted by Israel for the Hebrew people. But what we see here is that it's not a hard shift for him to make. He just says it like it is. Um, all of his anxiety is put to rest. And he says, oh, this is for everybody. It's not just for me and my tribe. It's not just for me and my people, not just for me and my nation, not just for me and my political bent, not just for me and my denomination, or not just for me and my whoever, he realizes this is a savior for all people and a light to all the nations. And then what he does is he puts a warning label on Jesus for Mary to read, right? He gives a warning label. He's like, I got some words from, uh, for you. He's going to be rejected by many. The deepest thoughts of people will be revealed and a sword will pierce your soul. Dang, that's not exactly what you want to hear as a new mom. Like, you're just brand new on the hospital. Can you imagine the doctor coming in saying that? He's like, oh, by the way, I had a little insight into your future. This guy's going to be rejected by everybody. Then he's going to, because he reveals the deepest things and thoughts of people, and the sword's going to pierce your soul. It's like, oh, that's not exactly encouraging words here, Simeon. But he spoke the truth because the light had come. And then that changed his opinion. It changed his understanding of what the Messiah had come to do. Uh, and the funny thing about Anne, the thing I love about Anne is she has no expectations. She's coming at it with no expectations. 
and she doesn't preach any sermons at, at Mary. She, that's, oh, I just love that. Um, but she is this woman who rises up in the scriptures as this faithful representative. Now it says that she's from the tribe of Asher. Why would the Bible mention this obscure fact in the middle of nowhere that she's from the tribe of Asher? Well, just a funny little free information for you. The, when Asher, one of the 12 tribes of Israel in the book of Genesis, um, when they settled into the promised land, they got this little section of the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Say that five times fast. I dare you. You might trip over your own tongue. But Anna is this representative figure for the northern lost tribes of Israel. Um, and the Zebulun and Naphtali is an essential geographical location for this um, Isaiah passage, uh, a very famous Christmas Isaiah passage that says, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. What people? Specifically, um, the people of Zebulun and Naphtali. Uh, so she's there representing all of them. Um, and what has happened? But she's endured tragedy. She was widowed seven years into her marriage. Uh, and yet she remains vigilant. She never left the temple. Um, and she also uh, corrects the false understanding that the Savior is just for Jerusalem or just for Israel. Uh, so Anna is this key figure in the life uh, of Jesus early on. Uh, and what, what we learn from this passage is that the door to the kingdom of God is wide, wide, wide open. And to stand in the light of that understanding that the kingdom of God is for all people and all nations and not just my group, my tribe, my ideology, my theology, my understanding, my denomination, but the door to the kingdom of God is wide open to stand in that light, that understanding. We have to set aside all our attempts to co-opt Jesus for our thing and for our kingdom. Uh, Simeon had to set aside any of his exclusism or favoritism that God was going to show. He had to set it aside uh, and he had to embrace the uh, grand plan of God to include all the nations and all people into this redemption. So what we learn from Christmas is that there is no more sacred thing in the whole uh, universe than to be human. Um, there's nothing else more sacred than to be human. This is the crazy thing that the incarnation of Christ reveals to us because God wraps himself in human flesh. Is there anything more holy than God? There is nothing more holy than God. God wraps himself in human flesh and becomes a human. So now God is human. So that means that there is nothing more sacred than to be human because God is human. Like we are human. But God became human in Christ and as a human ascended um, back to God. See, Jesus lived this perfect life of love, absolutely perfect, then died because that love was so great uh, for us all, and then defeated death because that love was so perfect and resurrected, and then ascended back to God. He didn't stop being human when he ascended back to God. Uh, he didn't stop being a human being. He was a human being, so he walked around, he ate fish, he talked with people. Uh, so he ascended back to God as a human person and then sent us the Spirit, the same Spirit that indwelled Christ, sent us the Spirit uh, to seal us, to, to empower us, to lead us, right? Um, so now there's no more sacred thing in all of creation than to be human, to be a human being because God is human like we are human and rescued us and united us back to God and there's nothing left for us to do to earn God's favor or to there's nothing left for us to do God did it all all we got to do is make real what Christ has made true Thank you so much for joining us for our 
uh, Sunday service here and Christmas tide. We got one more su Sunday of Christmas tide. It is Christmas all the way through this week, by the way. So you can keep saying Merry Christmas all you want to because it ain't not Christmas until January 6th when Epiphany starts. Uh, so we got one more Christmas tide Sunday. That will be January 3rd. We will see you then. Be blessed today. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. All that great stuff. Um, if you want to partner with us financially, uh, give a year-end gift one time. Uh, set up recurring giving with us. There's a link that kind of shows up through this video. Uh, and we, we would love to partner with you to partner with us, us to partner with you to be a source of hope, help, and healing for this uh, small little town of Langsburg and out into the interwebs world. Uh, Merry Christmas to you and all of yours, and we will see you next week. Peace.